Hello and good evening. So I'm Annika Stella. I'm the Scientific Director of the Health Education England Genomics Education Programme. And on behalf of the Genomics Education Programme and Progress Educational Trust, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event this evening, which is all about talking genomics with patients. This is part of our wider Genomics Conversation Week of Action campaign. And I really hope that you'd be interested in finding out more about what we're doing in this week. And so you can access information about this on our website. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Christine Patch, who likes to use Chris here. And she's one of the trustees of Progress Education, Educational Trust. And she's going to tell you more about how the panel discussion is going to go and a little bit more about the event tonight. Chris. Thank you all for coming. That's the first thing to say. I'm Chris Patch. As um, uh, Annika said, I'm a trustee of Progress Educational Trust. I'm also a nurse and genetic counsellor. And when I started in genetics, we had virtually no genetic tests. And what we did was talk with people. And we listened to their family histories. And we evaluated their risk. And we really had conversations about what that might mean. There's huge changes happening, there's huge excitement, there's enormous amounts of new science, but it's still at the heart of it, what we need to have with patients is conversations. And hopefully, with the help of this wonderful panel, we can get some conversations happening. So I'm going to leave them to introduce themselves very briefly, and then the format is, the Genomics Education Programme have given me four questions. And I will ask the questions to the panel in turn, and we'll see what, the converse, what conversation happens. After each question, I will give a pause if, if you want to raise questions or um, you know, uh, extend the conversation, and then we'll go on to the next question. But hopefully, we'll have a bit of time at the end to, to wrap up. So over to the panel to briefly introduce themselves. My name's Claudia. I am, I've come up from Winchester. I have um, three boys, Broden, who's 12, he has ADHD, um, I've got Chase, who's seven, and Trent, who is our swan, he's our undiagnosed boy, he's nonverbal. he's um, autistic, he's just now developing epilepsy, he doesn't eat, he's hypersensitive, um, and yep, yeah, he's our medical mystery. Hi, I'm Sabina, I'm on the 100,000 Genomes Project for myself, I have a rare neurological disease called dystonia, um, which is reasonably well under control most of the time, although I couldn't say that today. Um, so hopefully it'll behave while I'm, while I'm here tonight. Um, and I'm on the project to try and get answers about the disease for myself and also future generations of my family. Good evening, I'm Charlie and I, I come from Cambridge, so I've travelled down by train this evening. I have uh, two children, Imogen and Jasper. Imogen's six and Jasper's one. Um, both of them were um, born prematurely. Um, both of them have severe cerebral palsy. Um, and Imogen had a particularly severe form of epilepsy called West Syndrome. Uh, Jasper now has uh, some sort of, we're not entirely sure what it is, but it's, a, it's, it's some form of epilepsy. Um, Imogen was on the Deciphering Developmental Disorders study. I don't know if you've heard of that, sort of a pre-runner to the 100,000 genomes. Um, my wife and I and Imogen were then enrolled onto the 100,000 Genomes project because we couldn't find anything through DDD. And then Jasper um, has been, was enrolled into a very fast turnaround project called the Next Generation Children uh, Sequencing Project at Adam Brooks, uh, Cambridge University. And we still haven't found anything. So we, you know, it doesn't mean it's not genetic. It may well mean that we're just not yet looking in the right places in the genome. Thank you, all of you. It's just by chance, I think, that none of the panel have yet received a genetic diagnosis, although they've been very active in taking part in research. But that's a reality for um, many of the families that we see. We suspect there's something genetic in the family, but sometimes we can't find the exact, the exact genetic fault. But what I want to focus on is is really the conversations that you've had with healthcare professionals in, for some of you, some very long journeys. So, shall I start with you, Claudia, or shall I start with you, Charlie? But I'll start with you, Claudia. So, can you tell the audience and myself anything about the journey you've had to genetic or genomic testing? It started, well, when Trent was really, really young, and I started with him screaming nonstop, um, 
and he would pass out after screaming. So we'd take him into the hospital. They'd be, oh, no, he's just a baby. He's, he's reflux. It's, but being my third child, we sort of knew something was not right. Um, we have been through many, many tests. We've blood tests, MRIs, more blood tests, lumbar punches, more blood tests. And nothing has ever been able to answer why Trent is like he is. We have the mini diagnosis. So we have the autism we have now the epilepsy. We know he doesn't eat. We don't know why he doesn't eat. But the overall explanation of why Trent is like he is has never been answered. And then we found out about the 100,000 genome. Um, and when you're basically told, that's it, there's nothing else we can do. Unfortunately, your child is just going to be undiagnosed. It's quite a scary thing. To then find out about the 100,000 genome was, was fantastic to think that there was another hope, another sort of avenue that we could go down that could potentially explain it about him. Yeah, so it was just basically to try and get an answer and, and, and have an explanation about why he is like he is. And what kind of health professionals did you see in this journey? Was it a complete mixture or was it mostly one? Yeah, uh, yeah. we've had pediatrician, neurologist, geneticists. We've had a whole host of therapists. Um, yeah, just a whole host. We've, we've been quite lucky um, down where we are to have a fantastic team around trends. Sabina. So for yourself, I guess, have you, uh, how, what kind of journey have you had? Um, so I um, started with the symptoms of dystonia about four and a half years ago, I think. Um, a few other members of my family also have dystonia, so it was um, diagnosed, I guess, fairly early on. Um, and I was asked by my neurologist if I wanted to take part in the 100,000 Genomes Project um, last year and had my blood tests done in July so it's a very I'm very early in the process hoping for um for some results but nothing nothing back as yet so it's all fairly new and you talked about some other family members having a diagnosis so you sort of got a diagnosis yes. what difference would having the, the knowing of the, the the actual genetic change or genetic fault at this stage it would make little difference to me, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, what I'm hoping is that um, a diagnosis under the 100,000 Genomes Project will help them to identify similarities between my family and others um, and hopefully develop some sort of treatment. At the moment, it's very difficult to treat. Mm -hmm. um, and, ho yeah, I hope that it improves, improves life for, for people who suffer worse with it than me, I guess, in the future. Okay, so it's so, so a wider vision of wanting to help other people like Absolutely, yourself yeah. with the same problems. Yeah. And Charlie, you've had a, um, a difficult journey as well with your children. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned, um, my daughter was born prematurely at 30 weeks. She was in intensive care for, for uh, a month and we came home and everything seemed to be normal. Everything was fine. Um, and it wasn't until sort of about six months after she was born that we noticed that she'd stopped doing certain things. She'd stopped smiling and giggling and she'd sort of scream quite a lot during different parts of the day. And we went to the doctor and we were told it was reflux, which is, uh, I read there was a good a paper published last year which talks exactly about um, how often paediatric epilepsies are often misdiagnosed as uh, gastrointestinal reflux. Anyway, so we were prescribed some Gaviscon. Um, that didn't do the trick. Um, and then we noticed uh, my daughter one day just started making these curious movements, um, sort of uh, flying, that, do that, but her arms would fly out and her legs would do the same thing. Her, her eyes would roll into the back of her head and her, her head would sort of move to one side. Um, so we knew there was something wrong. We videoed it and we, we, we took her to Addenbrooke's um, where she was actually diagnosed by um, someone called Dr. Alistair Parker, who luckily for us is one of the key, key guys who knows about these sorts of epilepsies. Uh, diagnosed with something called West Syndrome or infantile spasms, and he put her on a clinical trial, uh, and that stopped her seizures um, within 24 hours. But at the same time, he asked us if we wanted to go into a genetic study. We had a choice of two, either the deciphering developmental disorders or speed. And I knew about the DDD study because I have just happened to work on the Genome campus. So Imogen was put onto that. As I said, nothing was found. Um, and then because of that, she was put onto the 100,000 genomes and again, nothing was found. And it wasn't until 
until actually the day of the twelve week scan of my um, my who would be my uh, my little boy. Um, it was literally as we were going in for the twelve week scan. I had an email pop into my phone that said your results have come back from hundred thousand. There is nothing that we know. It's negative. Um, and then unfortunately the same thing happened with Jasper. He was born prematurely and um, two months in um, intensive care. And then that was when he was. Um, um, that they, they, they could see on his, on his brain scan that he had this, uh, this brain damage. So. Can I just ask all three of you, it's, it's probably a long time ago, but when, when you first heard the term this might be genetic, what did that word feel like? Or? We didn't know enough about it, yeah. to be honest with you. In, in all the sort of testing that we did, we did a genetics test, which was, um, I think, just a very basic tier. And when that came back with no abnormality, we were like, okay, well, obviously it's not that. And it was, it was, it's strange to think, well, for us who don't know enough about it, that in 2019, there's still so much that we don't know. And it's, it's, it's fascinating, but on the flip side, scary and sad that we don't know enough about it yet. But it, yeah, we just, I didn't know enough about it, to be honest with you. Um, it's a bit different for me, I guess, um, compared to the others, um, really because there's so many members of my family that have the same yeah. or very similar varying symptoms of the same, the same disease. So... Um, it's not a surprise that there's a potential genetic yeah. link. Um, and I think it'd be nice to, to get that confirmed, really, because I think it's fairly obvious when there's so many of us that have got similar yeah. symptoms. Yeah. And you work in genetics, I know. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's different uh, when it touches your heart. <laughs> it's very different um, because um, before I... Um, so I, I spent m most of my career, well, all of my career, working for the Sanger Institute, which is responsible for generating around one third of the, the human genome. Um, so I spent a lot of my career in genomics. I'd actually spent a lot of my career actually looking at mouse genomics. Um, and so for me, um, genomics was very much um, a career, very interesting, but I never really saw the, the clinical side of it. And it wasn't until my, uh, my, my daughter developed this terrible epilepsy that I suddenly saw <laughs> the, the benefits of, of, of investigating her genome. Um, and for me, that, that led to a complete turnaround in my career. Um, and as, as you probably see in my biography, I've, I've put all my uh, efforts now into researching neurological disorders, and that's why I now work for who I do. So you've met lots of health professionals in your journeys. Yeah. And I know you, you've had these questions primed to you, so it's a difficult question to ask. But can you give an uh, example of a, a positive... Well, should we go the less than positive encounter first and then the positive one? So the less than uh, positive. We, um, we joined the 100,000 genome in November 15 and, um, and referred to the project by our neurologist in, South, in Southampton. And um, since we, ha we had the, the, the blood taken that and then we had a second MRI scan um, with Trent because he started what we thought forgetting things. Um, we had had a PVL, a periventricular leukomalacia diagnosis from the initial MRI scan that we had when Trent was little. And then when the subsequent MRI, it came out that he doesn't have that anymore. So we were very confused. And um, when you um, get given a whole lot of information at a, at a, at a, either through a phone call or it, um, at an appointment, it, it takes, it's a lot to take in. So when I tried to phone our neurologist to just to ask some follow-up questions, um, I never got any feedback. She never phoned back. So I literally phoned her for eight months, maybe once a week, sometimes twice a week, to try and speak to her to ask her these questions from the MRI scan. And then we had our follow-up appointment, our routine yearly appointment, in January 18. And when I walked into her office, um, there was a letter on, the, on her computer screen, and I said about the 100,000 genomes. So I said, oh, is that, is that his result? And she was, oh, yeah. And the letter was dated September before. So... It came back with no, no result, but it, it could not have. It could have been a result. It could have been a therapy that we could have put in place, whatever it may be. And that, that really threw me because um, it was sort of who, who has to feed back to us from the, from the project. Is it the referring clinician or is it the genetics guys? Um, she couldn't answer that. It was just, yeah, it wasn't nice. When you're waiting for so long to get some sort so of long. feedback and exactly. then you walk in and realize they've yeah. had the feedback for four months, yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah. In this case, there was nothing to follow on from that because there was no result, but it could have been a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And a positive encounter. 
Many. Um, okay. um, yeah, we have an absolutely fabulous pedi pediatrician, uh, Dr. Rebecca Ferris, in um, the Royal Hampshire Hospital in Winchester, and she's she's been in our corners from when Trent was very very young. Um, ask her questions. Her secretary, her team that work with her are phenomenal. So to have that when you've got a question, you can phone, email them, they get back to you within a few days. That's yeah, we are we are lucky to have her. So that's about the timely communication. Yeah, I mean, I don't expect when I phone a doctor or whoever it may be to get a phone call straight away. Appreciate, you know, they're very busy. They've got hundreds of, but within a week at least, not, mm -hmm. not even eight months. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. And you've, you've got quite a team looking after your, your children. Apart from the sort of genetic specialist, is there knowledge you'd want your team to have about the impact of genetic diagnoses or, or the possibility of genetic diagnosis? I think being an unknown, we don't know what we can put in place for Trent. So we are, as I said, very lucky. He goes to a fantastic special needs school in Winchester um, called Shepherds Down. So they're very knowledgeable. Um, we have an amazing team. He's got physios and um, speech and language and um, pediatrician. We've got you know, loads of people around him. But when you don't know what to do for him, um, you know, we do as much as we can. We do what we think is right. But when you don't know, yeah. that, that's the worst thing is the unknown. And Sabina, a less than positive conversation. <laughs> yeah, I guess we were talking about this just before, actually. Yeah. Um, for me, um, my journey with dystonia has been quite short. I've had two neurologists in that time. The first one was um, older than the second one and never discussed the genomic side of things with me, which now I find very disappointing. Um, I was with him for about three years, so... Um, it's dis disappointing that it took for a second neurologist, a younger neurologist, to come to come along to, to recommend that. Um, and also, um, the the thing that we were talking about just earlier is is the lack of understanding that I know me better than maybe 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 they do. And I think that's probably something that that most patients experience at, at one time or another. But it's um, I guess I live with with me every day and, and it's difficult for a, for a neurologist to, to understand what goes on in my body in a very short, short appointment. And did the first neurologist, did he know about your family history? Yes, and okay. had seen my cousin um, okay. as her neurologist, so yes. Right. Did, in the conversations with you, did he put that family history together at all? I actually requested for him to be my neuro neurologist yeah. at the beginning, and, and the reason I requested that is because he was also my cousin's, um, and I spoke to him about that very early on, but it, it was never really, never really recognised as a, as a relevant discussion at the okay. time. Okay. And a positive encounter. Yeah. Positive. My, my, um, my current neuro neurologist is... Um, a breath of fresh air, really. I'm very much into trying to find natural ways to improve my symptoms, and she's very um, interested in, in listening to what I've been doing and, um, and how, how I feel that it's helped me. Um, and she was the person that suggested the 100,000 Genomes Project. So, um, yeah, very, very positive all round from, from her. Really. I know all three of you are great advocates for the 100,000 Genomes Project and you do a lot of work. You're also very critical friends of the 100,000 Genomes Project, <laughs> I have to say. We have a marvellous participant panel who hold us to account very frequently. <laughs> um, but you keep coming back that even though you, you knew there was something in the family and you knew that you had it because of your symptoms, that you still wanted to know more about the genetics of it. And genomics of it yeah I, I i mean i i don't have children at the moment and would like to have children um at some point so um it would be very interesting to to know what the likelihood is of me passing this on to my own children um i have a niece who's seven years old i'd really like to know um you know whether what the chances are, are of her developing yeah. the, the illness because anybody that has got this the dystonia symptoms in my family tends to develop them in their mid-30s right. so um obviously the the children in the family have got a long way to go before they get to that point so yeah. it'd be it would be be nice to know for them yeah and um, if nothing yeah. else yeah and charlie we'll go for the less than positive first and then the more positive one afterwards well so first of all i'll say that my positives are wonderful 
but the negative was really just a catastrophic day. It was the Saturday before Christmas uh, 2017, and we'd gone into um, intensive care, a neonatal intensive care, two months after Jasper had been born. Um, everything was fine. We didn't know anything other than that he was going to be coming home in two days. Couldn't wait to get home for Christmas. Yeah, obviously, we were all really excited. We'd got to two months, everything was fine, and we were coming home. Um, and we got in, and um, Im everyone knew Imogen in, in intensive care because she was there in her, it's, it's called a whizzy bug, but it, it's essentially a, a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair for very small children. And she'd whiz off around the ward, and the nurses would see her and play with her and what have you, and, um, and she was very well known. So everyone knew that we'd had a difficulty with our first child. So we'd got into um, Jasper's ward, and um, I'd noticed that he, uh, Jasper had had his th uh, third and final brain scan, uh, uh, ultrasound. Um, and just out of curiosity, I said to the nurse, uh, everything fine, uh, I guess we can, you know, uh, that was done yesterday. And she said, oh, actually, the consultant needed to speak to you about that. <laughs> I thought, well, okay, that doesn't sound particularly good. Anyway, I went to the, the desk where all the nurses were, and I said, um, I understand there's a problem that the consultant needs to speak to us. Can you help us? Do you, what, what, what does that mean? Um, and anyway, in, in the meantime, my wife had had to go off to the milking room. And because Imogen has very... So she wasn't in the room at the time. The um, Someone had come in to speak to me, and he had such a strong accent, I couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, he said something about a cyst in the brain. And then, and then I said, well, can you write it down? And he came back with a piece of paper. And he'd written down what it was, periventricular leukomalacia. And I was just, oh my God, what, what on earth does this mean? I mean, I, I, I'm not a clinician at all, but I could piece together what those words meant, and they did not mean that that was not good news. And they said, well, the, clinician, uh, the, the consultant can come and see you in about five minutes, but in the meantime, my daughter, who's got very severe needs, had to go and have something to eat. If she doesn't do... If she doesn't go down to the cafe to have her glass of water and her meal, then all hell breaks loose and there's nothing you can do. You cannot have an adult conversation with her in the room. So we had to go off for an hour, then come back, and the consultant then couldn't see us for about another hour after that. So we were waiting in limbo for this to happen, and uh, eventually he did come through, and then he broke the news to us that Jasper had this, um, you know, this terrible uh, 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 brain damage. And it was just one catastrophe after another because we, we, we were left waiting. They knew our situation with our child. And it was just a, one thing after another, really, um, for that day. A uh, second bad thing that happened, we had, um, Imogen had to have a 24-hour uh, urine test um, about a year ago because she also has severe kidney problems. Um, that, was a, that was considered to be critical. So that was a year ago, and we still haven't had our... Results back. Positive now? Is there, I mean, we'll come on to sort of tips for health professionals in the next question, but they are terrible situations that just build on each other. Yeah. Is there anything very simple that could have been done that could have perhaps... Um, well, as bad? when the news was broken to us about Imogen, it was done incredibly well. It's a, you cannot break that news well. It's not an easy thing to do. But everything was done. We didn't, obviously we didn't know what the result was going to be. We had no idea it was going to be as catastrophic as, as our neurologist told us. But everything was done in order and we were only given the information when we were together and when we, it was the right time. So instead of someone coming to give me a piece of paper saying Imogen's got West Syndrome, we were sitting with her by her hospital bed and Dr. Alistair Parker came, he sat down with us, he drew the curtains, he had two um, other younger doctors with him, and he spoke to us quietly but very firmly and told us what had happened, what he was going to die, you know, what, what, what the diagnosis was, and that we had the option of to go into clinical trial, did we want that? And it was a very, very methodically done and very, very tenderly done, even though it was, I mean, this is life-changing news. Yeah. Um, but the situation with Jasper was just absolutely chaotic. Um, and, you know, nothing should have been said to us until the consultant could have come in and taken us off to a room. I mean, we, we just broke down. You know, and, and in fact, the nurse who worked in intensive care said she'd never seen two such broken people in all of her career. 
and that could have been done. I mean, there was another parent in the room at the time as well. It was just, it was just awful, Everything. just horrendous. Everything that could have gone wrong just went wrong, yeah. But the positives, yes. can I come on to yes. Yeah, so obviously the positive, Dr. Alistair Parker, I, I'm name dropping him, but he's just a, an amazing guy. Um, Imogen had a subsequent sweet, uh, seizure, and I emailed her neurologist, and the next morning he came up to see us in, in the ward. You know, that's not something that he necessarily, this is Gauta Mambig Yonker, um, our community paediatrician, we have her mobile phone number. Um, we, Jasper had suspected West Syndrome a few months ago. Uh, we phoned and he said, bring him in straight away, I'll make room for you. Mm -hmm. And then, then she managed to make room to have a, a, an electroencephalogram done at, up at Addenbrooke's. And then there's Lucy Raymond, um, who is our clinical geneticist. She um, managed to expedite our genomes out of the 100,000 genome study and get our negative result done. Even though it was negative and possibly there's something else in there, she went tirelessly with Mark Caulfield because she knew my wife was pregnant to get that done. She went way out of what she had to do. So my positives far outweigh the negatives because, you know, unfortunately... These things happen, don't they? Unfortunately, sometimes these things just get out of control. Once something gets out of control, you can't then bring it back into control. So. I mean, it strikes me in these conversations that we've, we're talking about genomic conversations, mm. but actually we're talking about difficult conversations. And they're difficult conversations that, as I don't know how many people in the audience are health professionals, um, but they're difficult conversations that we as health professionals can have all the time. Genomics may add another dimension, but it's still a difficult conversation. I mean, you've talked a bit about your sort of tips, but I just go back to Claudia and say, what, in terms of difficult conversations, which you've probably also had many with health professionals, what tips would you give people? I see there's a lot of people in the audience that are a lot younger than me, so people may be For more me, at the it's beginning. just communication. Right. Um, so we've had a cerebral palsy diagnosis we've had a which was taken away we've had a periventricular leukomalacia diagnosis which was taken away and then we've have a well we don't know what it is but when when as i said before when you get that information and they sit down they go oh he's got pvl and this is it and you walk away dr google becomes your friend because you haven't got all the information from the doctor at the time it's overwhelming and then when you try and follow up or try to get more information it's a communication is huge we rely so heavily on our doctors and therapists and teachers who, who are in this world, we have no special needs in our family. Mm -hmm. My husband's side or my side, this is the first time we have a child or a person in our family with this sort of thing. So this is a whole new road for us. So when you, when you want to be able to have a conversation with someone and you can't speak to them, it's, it's equally frustrating, it's heartbreaking, it's just it's really stressful mm -hmm. when you're trying to get your head around things that you know nothing about. And then you do go to Dr. Google, Dr. Google which is the worst thing to do. Um, so yeah, communication is, is, is huge. Mm -hmm. And just, just checking in. So, you know, we waited over two years. I understand the process of, of the genome sequencing and that. But when you're waiting for so long, just to check in and go, you're not forgotten. We don't have an answer yet, but you know, we're still here. Ask us a question, whatever it may be. Com communication in any sort of form yeah. is really important for families who are sitting there in limbo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sample's not in the fridge. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the sequencing centre. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sabina, in terms of sort of top, what, what makes a good communication encounter, as it were? What do people have to do to make it work better? I guess, for me, so I, um, whenever I go to the neurologist, I feel quite lucky that my symptoms are are reasonably well under control um, because there's always people around that are far far worse off than me but when I sit in that room with my neurologist um, the thing I want them to do is to understand that what might be insignificant compared to their previous patient might be really significant to me so those things that seem small when you've had a, a patient in for the appointment before who's much sicker than me doesn't mean that my symptoms aren't significant to me personally, mm -hmm. so it's understanding that the impact is different to different people, and it doesn't mean that they're any that those symptoms are any less important, even though they're not as severe. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you've is there anything else you'd like to add to what you've very <laughs> clearly described, both good and bad? 
when we had our, all our initial batch of tests done for Imogen, um, I was standing in, the, in another ward, same hospital, and there was a, a young lady <clears throat> with her child who was clearly very seriously ill with a neurological disease. I, I, I didn't know what it was, and she, um, and I'm going to put, I don't know how to put this politely, um, she was clearly from a, a disadvantaged family, and um, I started speaking with her. And she had one of the most eloquent conversations with her that I can remember. She started telling me all about the genetic diagnosis that her, her child had had and telling me about there had been a deletion on the, the P arm of chromosome 10 and which genes were involved. And I must admit, I was so ashamed of myself to, to judge her like that. It was, it was, it was, and I will regret that for the day I die. So what I think is interesting is that you can motivate, nothing will motivate you as much as you being ill or your child being ill, and you can then, you will, you will find out and become the expert on your disease, on your disorder. And as a doctor or as a healthcare worker or what have it, you will find, you will have patients coming to you who will be world leading authorities on their disorders. And they will know about genetics and they will know about genome sequencing and they will expect you to know. <laughs> so <laughs> I suggest if anyone here doesn't have much of a genetics background, they, they, they go back to their books. <laughs> In terms of health professionals generally, I mean, do you have any advice for them in approaching these difficult conversations? I think you've got to know your audience as well. So, as I said, we, we've never been in a special needs world. Um, so when you get given a diagnosis, it's terrifying. No matter how small, it, you know, it might be a small diagnosis, but to a family it can be huge. So I think if you're going to be able to, if you're going to be giving that information, hopefully face to face, um, I think you need to have the time to be able to sit there and let someone absorb the information, answer any questions, or perhaps if you can, phone a week later and say, it's been a week, do you have any questions? It's just being available. And I know, again, we, obviously we know the schedules that these doctors and clinicians and that have, but when it's something huge for a family to, to, to absorb or to, you know, to take, being available to be able to answer questions or have someone on your team be available that can answer questions, I think that's a big thing. I would often find myself saying to patients, well, I don't know the answer to that now. That's, and that's Is that okay? 100%, but then find out and come yeah. back to me. Yeah. Don't, I don't know, and then I have to go Dr. Google it, and that, that's always worse. Yeah. Um, but just, you know... You know, if you don't know, and, and I, like I said, you don't have to phone me back straight away. You don't have to have the answer straight away. But to be able to come back and say, look, I've looked into it. Here's what the answer is, is appreciated. Mm -hmm. Sabina, I don't know whether you've got anything to add. Um, probably less than, than Charlie and Claudia um, because of my situation. But um, I guess for me it's just about the same as Claudia, taking time. Um, but also realising that even the smallest thing that you say to a patient can really have a massive effect on, on the way that they understand what's happening. So um, for me, a, a very flippant comment from the first neurologist that I had about, oh, if it was the 1950s, we'd have locked you up in a mental institution, um, <laughs> which you don't think about while you, really while you're in that appointment, but when you get home, that really is, in, mm. you know, when you're worried about your symptoms and... and you know, that those kind of flippant comments which said at any other time wouldn't have that, that mm -hmm. kind of impact, but said at a time when you're worried and stressed and, and feeling sick is, can really have a massive impact. Yeah. I want to turn this around a bit to try and get some positive impacts, but what, what's, posi what's a positive way to speak with patients, to speak? Um, to listen more than, more than you talk often so okay. I'm from a sales background and I've always been taught you've got two of these and one of these use them in that proportion and the same goes I think you know yes you've got to tell information you've got to explain what's going on but it's even more important to listen to what what patients have got to say and what they're feeling what they're they're experiencing yeah yeah when I know when I was um I've worked in genetics a long time an awful long time until two years ago was working in a genetic service seeing patients. And what was very notable was that both for the medics, the doctors in training, and the genetic counselors in training, and the nurses in training who were coming through, that actually as you get more experienced, you say less, and you listen more. 
and you ask less questions, but the questions you ask are more relevant. And I think that that's, yeah, it's not all about the lecture in genetics and you've got 23 pairs of chromosomes and you get one from your mum and one from your dad and isn't this exciting, we might find your diagnosis. We're because people. you might, your people. We're people, we've got feelings. And, exactly. And that's important. Yeah. You might just be worried about your niece. Yeah. You know, and actually that's the focus of your discussion, your questioning that day rather than the question about, you know, gene mutations and stop mutations and frame shift mutations <laughs> and what we're going to do in our wonderful science for you. Yeah. I don't know whether you've got... I don't think I've really got anything to add to that. In fact, you even used the phrase, know your audience, which is exactly... <laughs> so that's what, that's what my, my wife always says, know your audience, yeah, because mm -hmm. you have to assess the situation. I'm sure every situation is different when you're breaking bad news, but, um, yeah. I was really struck by your story as well, because also, <clears throat> you know, you, uh, you, uh, about your story about that young woman who is a complete expert in her family's conditions. Yes, extraordinary, really. I yeah. mean, it shouldn't be extraordinary, but because as I said, you know, nothing motivates you. You can do anything if you're well enough motivated, but um, it was an extraordinary situation I found myself in, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of discussion, and I'm in the sort of education world, about people have got to know about gen more about genetics. They've got to know more about genomics, because they don't know enough, so they can't understand it. But again, my clinical experience is that it's a skill, hopefully, the skill of the clinician should be in helping patients and families and people understand the genomics and genetics that's relevant to their lives. And the most amazing, you meet the most amazing people who have the most incredible fundamental understanding of what their genetic information means to them and to their futures and their decisions about having children or that what they talk with their families about or what they talk with their children about. Um, so people generally don't need a course in genetics, but I think as health professionals, this is make a plea, we need a course in communication skills to enable us to work with them to understand the genetics and genomics that's relevant to their lives. And that's just my, my plea to anybody who's training or new in, in the audience. So any more comments or questions from, oh, there's a, there's a hand gone up back there. A couple of things, really. So first is, is communication. I think it's also really important for clinicians to understand the needs of the patient in front of them. So particularly if they don't speak English as a first language, then always making sure that you can, you've got someone there who can translate that information. But also a question for the panel is, I'm interested in what information you were given to take away. I had a very similar experience to you, Charlie, in that I was given a diagnosis on a scrap piece of paper with very little to back that up. So, of course, you go away then to look at the internet. Were you given any more detailed information about your conditions, and, and was that accessible? So, um, this comes back to the... So, both times we had the bad news broken to us. One was brilliantly done, and one was awful. When Imogen, when Imogen was diagnosed with West Syndrome, um, Alistair came with a leaflet... He had a sort of a, a, a you know, it was actually obviously printed out for this situation. Uh, he spoke not a great deal, just enough, and then he passed over the thing for us to read. And he said, you can read that and I'll come back to you a little bit later and you can ask me questions. For the second time, um, I think we were just so shocked that nothing really sunk in at all, apart from the, the, that those two long words, periventricular leukemia, and then, you know, what... It's difficult, it takes a little while to sort of calm down, um, register what's actually going on. So, yeah, nothing more than that, really. No, it was just a, a discussion. There was no, no pamphlet or, or booklet or anything to be given out. So, For me, I think Dr. Google has been my best friend. <laughs> um, sometimes not my best friend, but, um, yeah, I, I've been given very little information, so I've learned what I've learned about my condition myself, really, and from my other family members who've got the same, the mm -hmm. same condition. Um, when we were given the cerebral palsy diagnosis, I was given a scope um, pamphlet, and that was it. And if you've been onto a scope website when you've just been told your baby's got cerebral palsy, it's quite a scary thing. And then that was taken away. We didn't get anything from the PBL. Um, and Trent's just now started developing epilepsy. And the only thing that we were, get, 
they gave a lot of information. We, we had a chat about it, uh, but the only information I was given to take away was um, that he could die from it in his sleep. A piece of paper to say that they could have sudden death. Um, so no, Dr. Google, and yeah. yeah, no, no, no actual hard. And um, when we've sort of come to the conclusion that he's undiagnosed, never found out about the swan. I happened upon it, um, and they're a fantastic organisation for families that don't have a diagnosis. So um, they do know now, but they didn't then. So, oh, okay. Would all of you agree that uh, being given printed or either printed information or the address of a specific website that has the information, would all of you agree that was something that if you, in the case you weren't given it, would have improved your experience? Yeah, um, I think so. Um, yeah, not when, when you don't know anything about special needs and you suddenly get said, well, your child's X, Y, Z or your child's not, to be able to go and find a forum or whatever of people that are living with the same thing or have a family that don't have diagnosis, yeah, it's, it's important. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, the other thing that I would say is often these um, websites and, and leaflets are, are very one-dimensional, so they describe the symptoms of a particular illness, um, not recognising that different people experience different levels of those symptoms. So for me, I, I thought I was going to, you know, I've got a cousin that, that struggles to walk and I thought I was going to be in a wheelchair in 10 years' time and that clearly is not the case for me. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's recognising that, that different people will experience different levels of symptoms. Yeah, I think the, the, the leaflets certainly help... Um... Going back to the the, 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 the the situation, you don't really remember a lot, and it's something to go back to when it, sort of the dust settles, maybe a day or so later, and you've got then something which has obviously been clinically approved. Um, and I think SWAN and 100,000 Genomes have got some nice documentation which um, explains very, in layman's terms, the sorts of things you can expect. So I think that's the sort of thing that um, should very, be very much directed towards... Um, um, to, to patients and I mean, even things like Facebook groups um, or that sort of the social media where you can join and talk to other uh, families or, or, or patients who've got who've gone through similar things or what have you you can just talk about things even just just, just chatting um, and you, you never know you may find out some sort of useful bit of information and I know that we have done that, that sort of thing so yeah There's a question there Time remains a very limited commodity with clinicians, unfortunately, and it will continue to be like that for years to come. Number two, genomics and genetics individuals, the people who actually deal the subject, know lots of things which clinicians don't know. And likewise, old clinicians like me know lots of things which the geneticists and the genetic staff don't know. So this, there has to be a extensive bonding and transfer of information between these two groups of people who actually are meant to give all this information in a very capsulated and con concise manner to the patient. So yeah, there's lots of things need to be done to get to the, to the final output. And on top of it, genetics and clinical world is still not well connected with each other. There's lots of things in genes which we know are there, but we really don't know what is their function and what, how they're going to interpret in clinical world. So it, we are actually in infancy in the whole world. Although we have come to 100,000 genomes and to probably 1 million geno genomes, but we still are not, there's lots of information which is still gray, gray, gray. 100% understand about the whole, the time um, and we see it where we do try and make appointments. Or what, but you've got to understand the impact of telling a family your child has got X, Y, Z and say, okay, well, time's up. You know, I'm not saying that you, you have to give all the information straight away or uh, you may not know the answer to a question, as, as we've said before. But when you're, when you're giving a diagnosis or a no diagnosis, whatever it may be, to a family, it's a huge thing. And to be available to come back and ask questions. It might not, you know, I might not be able to ask all the questions. I understand time is a commodity, but when you're dealing with lives here and you're dealing with families who have a child in my regard or in Charles, you know, we don't know if it's life or death. You just, to have such an unknown, to live with such an unknown, 
yeah, it, it just, we have to be able to communicate and we have to be able to come back to our clinicians and our doctors who are giving us this information who, in, in a horrible way, crushing our world. And when you need that feedback or when you need that reassurance to be able to not speak to them, as horrible as the sound is not good enough. Um, you know, it's, it's our children or, or whatever it may be, our diagnosis it changes everything. And, you know, I understand there's a lot more being on the panel and what I've learned so far. There's so much more we don't understand or we don't know yet, and we understand that, but you still need to talk to us, and that's the biggest thing, talking to us. And even if you say, I don't know that, let me go and find out. To me, that would, that would appease me. And I take, I think the other point is that, um, conversations between the professionals, like you say, and recognizing there's a, I shouldn't really say this because I'm a genetic professional. There's a tendency in genetic professionals to say it's all about genetics and we're the experts in that, but other health professionals are experts in their domain and we need to converse with each other a bit more, I think. Um, I was going to ask, are there any other... Uh, yes, um, I wondered whether there was any difference um, between, as it were, breaking bad news to um, parents or individuals um, when there's a suspected genetic element as opposed to, you know, an accident or something that's just happened some other way. Um, so that, that, that's a question. I'd just also like to say two-way communication with medical professionals is just a complete nightmare. I mean, you know, it, it's... It's so often, it is just one way, and you can get nothing back, whatever. And it seems as though their whole system is designed that, you know, you have to make an appointment, but if you want to make any sort of response, you can't do it. Um, and I think that is a huge problem. And with email and all this social media, it's possible now. Um, but it doesn't seem possible for most of the medical practitioners. Can I just add, so there's something I forgot to say actually. Um, it it kind of comes back to the, what you say about clinical geneticists and you know, looking into the genes and how you know, the genes are so important, but also coming back to what you're saying about you know, the clinicians talking to us. I think, probably I forgot, one of the, the kindest things that our pediatric neurologist did, um, uh, he has some YouTube videos actually when he's, when he's speaking, and I've watched him. I'm not a stalker, but I've, I do like to... <laughs> I do like, <laughs> I do, I do follow him up because I, I, I admire him immensely. He's, he's the most incredible man. And I think ultimately he puts, he doesn't, it's not necessarily about a diagnosis. Well, it, it, for him, it's actually making the situation, uh, this terrible situation that his patients find them in, because he's a pediatric neurologist. He never gives people good news. He deals with the situation and how to make the situation manageable. So when we were in, when we were in intensive care, given the bad news, everyone was, oh no, we're going to have to do an MRI scan, we'll have to bring you in around Christmas or Boxing Day, blah, blah, blah. And he actually, he came in and he sat down and said, no, no, we're not going to do that because nothing's going to happen to Jasper for the next six months. I'm going to send you home. You're going to go home and enjoy your Christmas. You're going to just relax at home and be a family and then we'll worry about it in six months' time. And I thought, on reflection now, what a brilliant thing to do. There's nothing, why, why, why waste Christmas? Why have a terrible Christmas in hospital having all sorts of... Bits of, you know, a general anaesthetic for a little boy who's a couple of months old. Alistair said, no, go home. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, we'll do it in six months. And it gave us time to get to know Jasper as Jasper rather than as a, you know, someone with this, 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 this terrible MRI. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, this comes back to what you were saying, I think. And you. Mm -hmm. Is giving bad news, whatever the bad news is, any different if it's genetic? <laughs> I don't, I don't think there's very much difference, in all honesty. Um, and the reason I don't think there's any difference is you're dealing with a person and a person's life or a person's child's life. Um, and I think whatever that bad news is, it's important that it's delivered with sensitivity and with relevant information and, yeah, with compassion. Um, and whatever that bad news is, and, and whether it's genetic information or something else, I don't think it makes any difference. I think we've got to treat, treat giving that bad news in in the same sensitive way regardless. But is there a bit about whatever information you're giving, actually, whether it's bad or good news, about 
having the uh, knowledge and also the confidence to say what you don't know? Yeah, I think, I think confidence in... When you're giving information about genetics particularly, um, it's difficult, I'm sure, for clinicians to, to really understand everything that there is to know. There's so much to know, but um, understanding enough that you can confidently have that conversation with somebody, that you can answer their questions or say, I can't answer that now, but I will find out for you and you know where to go for that information. So, um, yeah, there's, there's the complication, I guess, with, with genomics is that it's a, a relatively... New, new field in the in the NHS and and you know that's that adds a level of complexity onto that bad news. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the last question I or the the final ish question I have, and I think we touched on it already. Um, where have been your sources of support and information? Uh, like I mentioned, my pediatrician, she's she's fantastic. Um, she's been she knows Trent. Um, when we go and see her, you, you feel that she knows him. She hasn't just sat for the last 10 minutes reading up his file to try and remember him. Um, we're very lucky at the school he's in. As I said before, they're teachers. Um, it's a specialty school, so they are very geared towards all sorts of different um, types of children. Um, Swan UK have been a lifeline. Um, being on the forum, be asking a question, and having 20 people come back and go, yeah, my kid did that, try this, try that, or here's a new sensory toy. So you're able to speak to someone who truly understands having a child with no diagnosis or um, who's going through whatever it is, to be able to have that sense of, um, I can't think of the word, but just, be, yeah, that's the word, to be able to speak to them. Um, yeah, I, th I think you, you need to find your tribe. You need to find the people who, who understand, um, who can listen. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of being able to speak to someone and they just listen. I don't need you to fix it. I don't need you know, feedback just to go, yeah, you know, we've been there, we understand, let it out, and no judgment. Um, for me, I, the Dystonia Society is fantastic. They have a lot of really, really good information. Um, there's some good Facebook groups and, and people that I follow on Instagram that have some really good, good, stuff, good and interesting stuff. Um, and from the genomic side of things, being part of the participants panel has been fantastic. I've learned so much. Um, I only joined, I think I've been to two meetings so far, but um, I've learned so much about, um, about our genes and, and how things work. And that, that's, that's been really exciting and, and interesting for me in, in this whole journey. Certainly, we take a lot of, um, take a lot of comfort. We get a lot of support from uh, other patients or parents who, who are going through the same things that you've met through, uh, special groups, whatever. Um, Personally, I take a great deal of comfort through the work I do. That gives me a huge amount of support. Um, I guess I mean, I'm, I'm lucky and cursed at the same time that I work in genomics. Um, so I've got to meet some extremely, well, some extraordinary clinicians um, and also some extraordinary scientists which have kind of, I guess, steered me in various different ways, given me inspiration. Um, and again, the 100,000 Genos participant panel, I don't know if any other people out here who, who have a who are on it, but uh, certainly taking comfort from speaking with other people and actually having a, a really big role in the direction that the 100,000 Genomes Project took, well, now, that, now that it's finished, so. Hands going up now. It always is as we approach the last straits. Hello. Um, so we, we've spoken a bit about how the doctors have spoken with you as grown-ups who can understand. Uh, has there been any communication with your older children at all about the situation so that they can understand, or has that been left to you to explain? Oh, yeah, completely up to me. Um, my six-year-old doesn't understand. He was 15 months when Trent was born, and it all kicked off. So to him, Trent's always been like that. For my oldest, Broden, obviously he knows things are different. Um, but no, yeah, there's, um, Broden goes to get, which is the young carers, so they support him in that way, but in terms of all the, like the autistic diagnosis and the epilepsy, it's, it's all down to us and trying to find age-appropriate information and be able to give it to him as a child because obviously there's a, there's a line between what he should know and what he doesn't need to know because he is a child. It's young, aren't they? But both are very young and, and, and Imogen is very... Um, she doesn't really understand, so she, for her life is just this little bubble, so... 
Uh, my question was actually very similar. Um, I was just wondering how this was sort of approached in telling the other members of your family, so it's like your parents and everyone else, because it really has struck me a lot how all three of you have spoken about this being very much a family thing. Clearly this is affecting you more as a family than necessarily as individuals. So I was just curious if you were sort of left on your own to just sort of tell people what's going on and when it seems that often you didn't have a lot of information yourselves. Again, because we have nothing like this in our family, it's, it's been quite hard, but it's been interesting the... Um, the advice you get. So it, it's really hard for a lot of people to get their head around that there's no diagnosis. For someone who doesn't, who hasn't been to doctors and things like that, they think, oh, it's 2019, they must be able to answer it. So when you start getting mini advice like um, camel milk, apparently, so <laughs> cures autism. Um, yeah, I've had that. Uh, broccoli. So you get all these, you start getting a lot of these helpful advice, which is not, and you get the Oh, bless him, he'll grow out of it. Or, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's, again, left to us to try and explain to, to families, and in my case, trying to explain to my, my families, and especially the older generation, that um, he, we don't know why he is like he is. We may never know why he is like he is. And just reiterating that quite often because they just they don't get it. Um, a little bit different for me, I guess, because my grandma had, um, while she never had diagnosed dystonia, she certainly had... A, a nodding head, which I think at the time was, um, I think people used to take the mickey out before a little bit, which now seems terrible, um, but nobody really understood why why it happened. So um, I'm the third generation of, of people in my family that have got dystonia, so um, a little bit different because everyone kind of knows about it and, and understands the basics, really. So. Including the genetic side of things? Not the genetic side of things, no. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think there's really that... Uh, my parents are very interested, but I don't think there's a huge amount of appetite from, from some of the other members of my family to, to truly understand that side of things. But I guess if, um, if I get a diagnosis back from the 100,000 genomes, then that will probably become of real interest to, to everybody, I guess. Do they see it as just something that is in the family? Yes, yeah. very much so, yeah. Uh, and um, because it's been around in the family for such a long time, I guess, and, and there's so many members of my family that have... Symptoms of varying degrees. So, yeah. so when we, um, we had our first genetic test done, the uh, clinical geneticist drew out a, a pedigree. I think it was probably just me and my wife and Imogen. And she said, you don't have epilepsy. Imogen does. It's unlikely it's going to happen again. It was that sort of detail, which is, wasn't really particularly helpful. Um, but when we were enrolled on to um, the... Um, the, the latest genetic study, that the, the pedigree was really in-depth and went back quite a long way, but that was partly because of the conversation I'd had with my, uh, my father-in-law. So my wife is German, she's actually considerably younger than I am, um, and he'd spent a long time drawing out his family's pedigree tree, uh, going back many generations, and I was looking at it, and I was looking at all the different children they'd had, and the numbers, and that's odd. These people, they have, you know, back in the sort of the early 1900s, these Families should be having loads and loads of children, but these women are having none, and they're all dying. In, you know, they're all dying very early. And I was just chatting to him and said, "So, what do you? Um, are there any other symptoms in your family?" That he said, "Well, my um, my my uh, my sister's got epilepsy. Um, I've got really bad cataracts and cataracts all the way back up through my uh, my mother. And uh, I wrote these things down. They've been stroke and stuff. And I was chatting with um, one of my collaborators at the Epilepsy Society and." He asked me the same question about, is there anything else you know about? And um, I said, well, I don't think it's any, of any relevance at all, but um, my, my wife has got cataracts, my grand oh, and her father's got cataracts all the way back, and I could actually hear him take a breath on the phone, because he was just publishing a paper about uh, children with periventricular leukomalacia, um, where there's this thing called, I think it's genetic anticipation or something, where symptoms get progressively worse over generations, and these families had had... Um, cataracts and stroke. So that's something to look for in the future. Okay, I can see somebody delving into the 100,000 <laughs> Genome Project data. So anyway, yes, that was uh, talking about speak. Yeah, talk, <laughs> yeah. talking about things with the family. Yeah. So I would also like to acknowledge the work of um, well, Swan is part of well, Swan Genetic Alliance and Rare Disease UK are all three groups, and Rare Disease UK lobbies very hard for better care for families with rare disease in the UK. And I'd just like to acknowledge their work as well, in that it's not only just about the science, it's also about the long-term 
future and care for families of rare diseases. I think Baroness Blackwood mentioned something about yeah. that on the, on the 27th of February, the day before Rare Disease Day. Uh, she's firmly ensconced in the House of Laws now to, to start giving the elbows to people to make sure that you know, yeah. things... Because she actually has a, a rare disease herself, so she's a great champion. On a practical level from that as well, at Genetic Alliance UK, we're currently um, looking for funding for, uh, to, to extend a pilot we ran before called Building Rare Communities, which is all about helping families that have had diagnosis through sequencing come together to create support groups, to create information, to look at how can you um, develop research and get researchers interested. So. Any other comments, questions, points of view? Hi, uh, my name's Katrina. I'm a trainee genetic counsellor here in Birmingham. I guess my first question is, have any of you had any interaction? It's a very selfish question. Um, have any of you had any interaction with genetic counsellors? And if so, anything good or bad about those interactions? Any particular tips in that situation? It doesn't... You're shaking your head, so it sounds like no. And do you feel like that would have been something that you would have liked to have had that option? Do you feel like that would have added anything to your experiences? Well, so I mean, we, we had um, we had discussions about um, what our our family tree would you know, look like and uh, what the what the um, the chances of things happening again would be, and um, we were told it's likely to be a de novo mutation. And of course, it turns out that really, you know, we don't really know. Now, in our case, it, it it probably wasn't a de novo mutation. Again, we don't know. <laughs> But um, um, I, th I think it might, it, it was, it's, it's, it's vaguely helpful, but um, on reflection, yeah, we, we took the plunge again and yeah, lightning struck twice. So. so is there anything, do you want to sort of sum up any final thoughts? We've been on the, on the road now with Trent on this, on this journey for five years and we've met some amazing doctors and therapists. So... Um, Although we've, we've talked about the lack of communication, or I've spoken about the lack of communication or not knowing things, I think it's important to know that we really appreciate yeah. everyone that is taking the time to look, look at Trent. Um, in my case, I'm talking obviously, um, you know, who do, do talk to us, who do give us information, who do back our corner, you know, back us. Because when you're going down this road and you have absolutely no idea which way to go, to have someone in your corner is appreciated. So, um, yeah, just, just keep talking to us. That's it, really. Yeah. Um, I think just, I think the whole um, genomics conversation is fascinating and there's so much more to come from it. Um, and I, I think just, carry, you know, for anyone that works in that field, just to carry on with the excellent work they're doing will hopefully in the future help so many families and, you know, parents like Charlie and, and Claudia. So... So I guess, you know, my ask is just to carry on, really. Carry on talking. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, 100,000 genomes is world leading. It just hasn't been done before. So, you know, there are going to be difficulties. And, you know, we're still finding our way. So mm -hmm. I guess it's, part, it's the, the patient's responsibility to help um, drive that. Okay. I mean, I'd like to thank the three of you for taking time out of your very busy lives to come and uh, uh, be listened to and also listen to the audience. It's difficult to know how to sum this up, really, um, because we, we've had a conversation about conversations. Um, some of the things that have come through is timing, um, being aware what is insignificant to one patient could be very significant to another. Consider your audience, <laughs> think of the person, and I think what you've provided is, and what the audience have provided as well, thank you, is the stories that remind us behind every medical problem and behind every genome, there's a person. Um, and uh, that's really important, and we mustn't forget that. And also listening. And perhaps we ought to be not talking genomics for patients, but listening about genomics with patients. So thank you very much for coming along and taking part in this event, and thanking all of you for taking part in this event. Thank you.